Uh, yeah, so thank you for coming to my talk uh, and for the warm introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Pulsar Summit uh, to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing at Discord for about the last one and a half years, uh, taking Flink, combining it with Pulsar and Iceberg to build a real-time stream, uh, streaming machine learning platform. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to kind of set the tone for machine learning and why uh, it has a little bit of different requirements than what you have in other event-driven applications. Uh, and then I'm going to deep dive into some of the technical choices that we made when we were building this system that address those kinds of specific needs for machine learning. Um, but the essence of this talk is not necessarily about the individual technologies, um, but about how I think that we've come to a point uh, in the maturity of these technologies and the connections between them, this kind of ecosystem around them, um, that what now exists can be used to uh, build something that is really powerful and useful um, purely based on open source technologies, even with a very small uh, set of engineers uh, that built the work that you are about to see. Um, so hopefully whether you are kind of a veteran in the streaming world or you're kind of curious or new to machine learning, there's something uh, in this talk for everybody. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is David Crystal, like I was introduced, and I'm currently working at Discord uh, for the last year and a half on the applied machine learning team. Now our team is largely split into two focus areas, safety and personalization. Most of my work and uh, the kind of prototype system that we built here is oriented for safety machine learning or sometimes called anti-abuse machine learning. Uh, so I have about six years of experience in this space previously at LinkedIn and Cash App and seeing the whole kind of gamut of problems that you have to try to tackle with machine learning. Um, and what this means is that we're operating at a very large scale. So this is not just a question of like, oh, we want to detect a few fake accounts. We're operating at the scale of like millions of accounts and we have to deal with uh, bot attacks, very spiky, unexpected traffic. Um, so, and we're oper also operating like platform-wide and in kind of multiple facets of uh, the products. Uh, my background is actually in experimental physics. My PhD was in quantum computing. So I used to work with lasers, microwaves, cryogenics, uh, did lots of experiments and uh, along the way learned some very advanced statistical techniques and that's how I got into this line of work, which is uh, quite a bit of fun. Um, so this is the agenda for the talk. I'm gonna talk about Discord, what it is, um, and motivate why people are generally interested in real-time streaming generally and then also certain applications at Discord. And I'm also gonna talk about some Discord-specific infrastructure pains uh, in terms of using machine learning uh, that this platform is going to help us address. Um, we selected Apache Flink for this platform that we built, and uh, I'll describe why we think Flink is a real clear leader in this space. It's especially mature, and the integrations with things are really nice. Um, we're going to talk about the two fundamental technologies, Pulsar, which we use for um, serving real-time events, and why it's really great if you're going to use uh, Flink. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Iceberg, which you may be a little less familiar with. This is a cloud storage format that effectively lets you make a very large data lake house that is streaming friendly. Um, and finally, we're going to put it all end to end uh, at the end of the talk where we're taking raw data, we're able to make sophisticated features, have an ML model inside the streaming job, and output the scores um, and kind of uh, what we did to make the developer experience in using this system really, really solid. So. All right, so first, what is Discord? It is a real-time video communication platform for hanging out via text or voice or video channels. Um, and that can be whether it's one-on-one. -on -one. You can be in very small servers with just a few people. Um, these are kind of small groups. It can be slightly larger communities or it can be servers and communities that are, have millions of people within them. Um, it started in 2015. It was originally very popular in the gaming community, but it's expanded into a number of other communities uh, ever since then and continues to grow. Like I mentioned, users can join multiple servers. Um, and we have about 150 million monthly active users spread across 9 million monthly active servers. Um, so safety, which I mentioned, uh, which is that kind of one element of our ML teams, has a large focus on um, combating spam. So that's minimizing users' exposure to spam, uh, uh, spammers, spam content. We have significant efforts in kind of cross-functional teams um, that are all working to build the infra and address this problem in various ways. Um, another area is we think about um, account security. So we want to um, protect Discord users' uh, accounts from being compromised uh, as proactively as possible, and we also want to um, detect that as fast as possible if it does end up happening. Um, so an important point in this space that I'm hoping I'm conveying is that the speed and the scalability of what we build really matters. And the same is true for um, personalization efforts. Like you could think about helping users discover new servers or figuring out um, what the right type of notification to send them is um, as fast as possible so that they can see the content um, that may you know, not be relevant in just a few minutes uh, 
a few minutes later. And so we're starting to think about those applications, but most of the focus here uh, is on these kind of safety applications. Um, so stepping back just into like general areas of uh, stateful stream processing that are interesting. It has a bunch of applications. These event-driven architectures are a bit different from traditional architectures using like relational databases. Here, these applications consume uh, uh, kind of a continuous flow of events, and they perform real-time computations and state updates. They tend to be very scalable um, due to that asynchronous nature. Um, and you can think about building a lot of different tools that are um, people would consider event-driven. Like you could build a rules engine uh, to detect fraud if you wanted to. You could do business process monitoring. There's another area of application that's very popular in analytics. So analytics, you are taking typically batch queries um, that you've been working with maybe for a long time, and you're trying to make those as close to real time as possible. So instead of a kind of single output, what you get is a continuously updating view of the result of uh, a SQL query, even if it contains very complex logic. Um, so crucially for our focus today, it's gonna be on um, using it for kind of data and ML pipelines. These frameworks are so powerful. They let you filter, transform, join, aggregate. You have so much freedom in how you manipulate the data, um, and, it, and it works very efficiently even at real time. And so these pipelines, again, can be very simple, something like event ingestion and deduplication. You can do ETL tasks with them. Um, and for us, we're gonna try and kind of combine a bunch of these things all together in uh, one application so that we can do uh, ML uh, on streaming data with pretty low latency. Um, so there are particular elements of ML that make it a bit different from uh, other workflows, and it means that our developers need to iterate quickly. First, even if you have a rigorous understanding of the model, the data, you're very familiar with it, you don't really know if this new feature, or this new model or change is actually going to improve um, your solution to your business problem. Um, when it comes to gauging the quality of these uh, models, uh, it's hard to understand them. The interpretability is really tough. The final arbiter is uh, working with offline metrics and saying, oh, well, how would this have performed in the past? Or the ultimate one is to you know, put it online and do a randomized controlled experiment um, and look at the way that the metrics change. That's really the, the end, uh, you know, end decision maker. So this leads uh, me to the third point, that even when you're building these things, you're making improvements, um, you may find bugs, you need to be able to iterate, and each one of those means that you need to go and like, pot potentially recompute data in the past. So you need to make that kind of... Uh, as fast as possible. And lastly, when it comes to tooling, the ML uh, space generally has a ton of tools, and so you want some kind of a pathway to integrate that. So if you're using language like Java or Python, um, that's great, because you have access to uh, a lot of libraries that you can use for um, ML. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the technical parts. Um, so for responding to abuse, uh, Discord's existing infrastructure for safety it looks like this. In the bottom is our kind of core rules engine. Um, and it was originally designed for making heuristics. So these are human-developed rules that use kind of raw signals, and then you try to combine them together to say, ah, oh, this is a signal that we want to detect and, and respond to. Um, so it was originally designed for that and not necessarily for machine learning. And now we want to use machine learning to improve our performance um, to keep Discord users safe. Um, so this rules engine, it primarily only lets you use data that are within the event. So this is a stateless transformation. Um, you can't really remember historical events in an easy way. We do have separate microservices for things like counters, but even computing an average in this system is uh, hard to do. So coming from a batch world, you're, you're, you're pretty limited. The other thing is, um, just like a regular microservice, when you deploy it, like that's your code change. If I make a feature today, I need to have uh, historical data. Well, I can log that forward, um, but if this model requires months of training data, I can't wait a month to start using this feature that I built. I mean, imagine if you had a bug in it, and now you're like, oh, I guess I have to start all over. So that's kind of, uh, it doesn't really make sense. Um, in the upper left, we use a batch data engine, so we use BigQuery, and it has access to production dumps, and it has access to analytics events, and this rules engine doesn't, so that's another kind of pain point where um, we don't have access to all the data that we wanna use. Analytics events are typically used for um, when we launch a new feature, understanding if we've actually enhanced uh, Discord users' experience on the product. Um, but uh, we don't have access to those in a safety system other than through this batch um, pathway. So what batch gets right is you have a ton of flexibility. You can join all these data sources together and make it as complicated as you want, but the problem is that it's fundamentally just slow. It's always gonna be delayed, um, either by the time the engine takes, how fast the data gets ingested, all of this stuff adds to delay. Um, the other thing is that uh, even when you get the data in there, you have to stitch it together with these kind of real-time features, and that's kind of bug-prone. 
Um, there's no error message or stack trace that's thrown when you make a bug in a machine learning model. It's like your model just kind of performs worse, but there's all sorts of reasons why that could be, and so it's very hard to debug these issues. It would be great if you just designed your system in a way to try to avoid the, those bugs from ever coming up, and streaming kind of helps us do that. Um, and then lastly, we kind of create this, this separate microservice, too, um, for each model. Like, it works for us, and it's actually great in this architecture, but it does add complexity. So even if we're just taking in some features, using a model to compute a score and output it, that's like a whole other separate service. Um, it would be nice if we could kind of simplify uh, that, that infrastructure. And again, the, I think the speed thing is really important um, and the flexibility, because attackers adapt, they're very fast, so we have to kind of keep up with them and move uh, as fast as we, we can. All right, so uh, Apache Flink. This is uh, the technology that we chose to be our kind of core stream processing en engine. And we had a number of requirements that we're very interested in. So we want a framework for ML engineers to do um, stream processing, to do very sophisticated transformations. We don't want them to be kind of locked into something that's either too simple um, and doesn't allow them to have low-level control, but we also do want them to have these high-level APIs um, so that they're able to do their jobs efficiently and express complex transformations um, as, as easily as possible. Um, it needs backfilling support. I think that's like one of the very distinguishing things about ML is we have to be able to go back in time and compute what the feature was months or even a year ago, and that needs to happen within you know, hours or whatever. As long as you make that as fast as possible, that's um, you know, the right direction. Um, it needs to be production ready, popular, um, scalable. We want to use something popular because it means, you know, hopefully a lot of the bugs have been taken out and a lot of the things around the core engine have been fleshed out. And I think that's one area where Flink really shines. Um, fault tolerance, observability, debugging, all of those things are pretty non-negotiable at our scale. We can't tolerate a lot of downtime. And we also kind of want to unify data sources. So having connectors to other external data systems is uh, important to us. Um, so we did select Flink and it has a number of really great capabilities. The first is that it has unified batch and streaming. So what this means is I can write a feature and it operates in an identical way whether you're operating in streaming mode or you're doing a backfill in batch mode. And you don't have to change the code or have two separate implementations. It all works kind of the same way. So that's really good for um, reducing bugs and improving productivity. It has a rich set of APIs um, all the way from SQL down into process functions which uh, expose streaming primitives. I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and it's proven at scale. There are massive tech giants running thousands of jobs in production at Flink. We don't have to worry about that. Um, one of the biggest points is the vibrant community. It's one of the most active Apache mailing lists. Um, there are tons of Stack Overflow questions that you can find. You can find presentations of people actually building something with this system. And I think when you're an engineer or you're even just trying to think about what can you build, it's super important to have uh, something out there that you can uh, look at and give you all sorts of ideas to see what is really possible uh, in practice. Um, it has good connector support for both Pulsar and Iceberg. I'll focus on that later in the talk. And uh, it uses Java, which gives us uh, access to a lot of libraries, but has a Python API. That's also a very popular language uh, within, uh, within Discord. Um, so I, as I mentioned, Flink offers different APIs. These, IP, these APIs let you, as an engineer, choose the right level of abstraction for your problem. Um, at the top, the highest level of abstraction is Flink SQL. You can literally write a SQL statement on a stream and get the output. Then there's the table API, which is very similar to the SQL one. It's a little bit more composable. It can be more intuitive in some cases. Um, and then you start to get into the data stream API, which is more of a MapReduce style framework or something if you're familiar with uh, like data frames and Spark. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit kind of like that. Uh, at the lowest level, you can use what's called the process function. So here you start to get exposed to streaming primitives that are related to time, so processing time, event time, timers. You can write custom Java code to manipulate uh, the internal state directly. And for what we do, where we're interested in being able to make speed and accuracy trade-offs, this is, this is really critical for us. So we wouldn't want just the highest level APIs. Um, and the other cool thing that I'll mention too is that in all of our applications, we essentially use like all four of the APIs. You don't have to like pick one when you start the job and then you're locked into that for the rest of your job. You can switch between them. So I think that's another kind of unique feature uh, of Flink. It lets you kind of get that custom control when needed but not uh, have to sacrifice anything. Um, so going further in the, f the theme of flexibility of Flink. So especially for low latency applications like anti-abuse, risk, fraud, any of that kind of stuff, Flink offers you fine control when needed over time. So there's two 
time concepts uh, in streaming. There's processing time, that's the time that you get the event inside your application, and then there's event time, which is like when the event actually happens. So that was you know, some time ago before it reaches your system, and it can even be out of order in that. Um, it can even get an out of orderness before it gets to you. Um, so to explain why this is important on the bottom, we see the stream of events that are coming into our streaming operator with timestamps, um, and at the top is a set of 10 second long count windows, and they update every five seconds. And they're, for example, keyed by users. This is basically group by and count of an event um, on a stream. Um, as events come in, uh, they are placed uh, inside of these appropriate windows, uh, and Flink will do this automatically, and some events are part of multiple count windows. Um, Flink has this concept of a watermark, which is really important. It was popularized by uh, the data flow model from, originally from Google, which Flink implements. Um, and it is a special kind of event. And it's basically a timestamp. And it's, has, if it's a timestamp of 10 seconds, it says, ah, I have received all of the events up to this point. And so if there's anything that depends on that, I know that I will have an accurate result. Um, I could have uh, chosen to just process the events as fast as possible, but then I would have uh, inaccurate results. And so you can kind of pick what you want to do uh, within Flink. Uh, and so you can see like, if these other kind of events come in and you had said, ah, I'm done with what I want to do at 20 seconds, um, you may have missed uh, some of the events that, that would have come later due to kind of inherent out of orderness in your system. Uh, so I know this is a bit technical, but it really matters for having uh, accurate results. And that brings us into Pulsar. So as I mentioned, um, we're migrating to Pulsar. Uh, and we have kind of integrated Pulsar and Iceberg together, but we didn't originally start this way. Uh, we started using uh, Google Cloud's PubSub uh, technology because this serves the majority of Discord's internal event traffic. Um, many of Discord's e existing use cases are very well served by PubSub, and typically those are use cases that don't care about time. Uh, they are wide fan out work queues. You want to dump a bunch of items onto a queue, and you want to have a large number of workers just process those. And you are totally OK in most cases uh, with at least once delivery. All the stuff that you're trying to do is mostly stateless. Um, but it necessitated a change once we actually built a prototype and put stuff in production using this system. So um, one thing that we found is the Flink pub sub connector it receives very little maintenance. It doesn't have the unified batch and stream API. We've had to use like an open pull request in order to make that happen. Um, it has a very, very high watermark lag. So this is like 20 to 40 seconds in some cases. And this watermark, again, is like what you use to make sure that your results are accurate. And you don't need it all the time, but ideally you want the lag to be as low as possible. And you can't really do that in this system. Um, it, this becomes especially problematic when you, uh, things get backed up. Uh, and that causes a lot of real headaches when people are trying to deploy this, and we don't want that experience for our developers. And it has some missing features like transactions, and uh, the cost also becomes high at a certain scale. Um, so the right approach is actually to change to a different technology. Um, so with Pulsar, this is Pulsar Conference, so we all know that this is a scalable, kind of production-ready system. The key for us is that it not only has that queue delivery mode, which is very, very popular in Discord, but it also has this partition-style delivery mode. Um, and if you look in the lower right, the idea is that these partitions have a time ordering guarantee on them that queues don't, and we take advantage of that to have a very short uh, watermark uh, kind of experience. And so that's how we can get accurate results with low latency. It has this disaggregated storage and compute, makes scaling easy. There are managed solutions like through Stream Native, so we don't have to think about infrastructure as much as we uh, would otherwise have to. And it supports Java, Python, and Rust, which are popular languages within Discord. I think the Flink Pulsar connector deserves a special mention because it has this unified batch uh, source and sync. Uh, it, it's actively maintained. It was originally developed by Stream Native and then donated. Um, you can do SQL directly on streams. It's really great. And all of the extras um, are also in the connector. So these connectors are not particularly easy to write. They map Flink's fault tolerance model onto the external data system that you're working with. So you have to kind of know the ins and outs of both of them in order to write these. We have a very small team. We are not in the business of con uh, connector maintenance, so it's great to have something that's powerful and just works uh, really well uh, out of the box. So this is kind of the infrastructure that we are building. Um, the new stuff is in blue. The existing stuff is in black, and that's kind of a separate part of the company. And so what, we, what we're doing to kind of migrate is we, we take a tap off of this validation service, which is an existing service that has these analytics events. We put that into a buffer, uh, and then we do some schema translation and encoding 
uh, and put those on separate Pulsar topics, which is way more organized than having all your events on a single topic, uh, which makes it kind of hard and kind of expensive to deal with. We're taking the safety events, uh, and then we're restreaming those also into a Pulsar topic. And the goal here is that our engineers can build um, uh, any kind of application, select any event that they want. This architecture is also simpler for uh, doing access control in a, in a cleaner, uh, more kind of observable way. Um, and we're switching to things like protobufs so uh, that our serialization is much faster, more efficient, and our developers have uh, strong type safety. All right. And so historical events and backfilling with Iceberg. So, so far, we've only gotten to one part of the story, which is events that have uh, happened in the last few hours or maybe the, the last few days. Um, those are typical retention times that we would use of the technology uh, like Pulsar. Um, and this is where Iceberg comes in. So uh, as we think about this backfilling problem, we need access to long uh, histories of historical events, like definitely greater than 30 days, usually something like multiple months. Increasing retention of the topic can be expensive, and it's also not a very great solution because you can't query these things as easily with batch engines uh, today, and we also need to delete data, so an immutable log does not uh, lend itself to deleting data very easily. Uh, and that's just due, due to user privacy and compliance uh, uh, mandates. Um, so this is where Iceberg is uh, something that really shines. So Iceberg is a table format, it's not a file format. It solves a lot of the headaches that you have with raw files on cloud storage. And the important thing for us is that it's cost effective, vendor agnostic, and that we can read events in a streaming friendly way due to something called event time alignment, which is built into the Flink Iceberg connector. And so this issue of time keeps coming up, and what we want is these kind of time-ordered reads in the system with minimal code changes, and that's what Iceberg uh, allows us to do. All right, so putting this all together. When you are an engineer and you write this job, um, you can deploy it at will. It will use the same production data in development uh, as it would actually in production. So you have the same kind of output and behavior that you would see there, um, even if your kind of development job is well isolated from production, which is great. Uh, you start your job maybe months ago or even a year ago uh, at a timestamp in the past, and these raw event data are read from this iceberg table in this event-ordered way, and that's what allows us to have this kind of smooth watermark behavior that I've been talking about. Um, the backfill has now started kind of making progress. We're getting closer to the present, accumulating state, outputting results. Um, and uh, like I said, things are still stable because even with a gigantic qu uh, quantity of data, we're able to process it all incrementally. Um, but we're catching up to the present. Uh, and then there's another very special feature of Flink, which was also open source by a company. So like I said, the open source element of this is a huge benefit. We're not the only one trying to solve this problem. Is how do we switch from a batch source like Iceberg to a streaming source uh, like Pulsar. And there's a open source thing called the hybrid source, which allows you to combine multiple Flink sources together and make them a truly kind of seamless source. So it abstracts it away from any of your engineers from ever having to think or care about this, which is really the nice goal. So all that happens under the hood is it just picks a timestamp and you switch from one source to the other and everything uh, is, is totally seamless. And so we just abstract it all away. Um, so what we have here in this system is really cool. This is our kind of refined architecture, which has fewer moving parts. We have access to all the different event types that we want. Our engineers don't have to care about where they come from. They're served with this proper partition style delivery, so we get those low lag uh, watermarks. Uh, diving into that Flink job, it houses all of our feature computations, which are filters, aggregations, joins, et cetera. We run this thing uh, once over a long, you know, multi-month period, dump the results to the, an iceberg table, and that's our training data. You can train a model on this, uh, and then the machine learning component of it really comes in through something called Onyx, which is an open neural network uh, exchange format. So you can use tools like XGBoost, PyTorch, TensorFlow, make your model in any system that you want, and then convert it into this Onyx format. And what we do is uh, take that binary and load it with the Onyx ML inference library. And this can happen directly in your Flink job. So now you don't need a separate service. Um, and the potential for bugs, like with stitching and trying to mix all these different sources together by hand, which are really hard to debug, they're just naturally at a lower probability of happening. Um, so it can make kind of development faster and just simpler in a way. And this is not a new idea. This is effectively just saying, ah, this is a Kappa architecture instead of a Lambda architect architecture. 
But the cool thing is like you can build this even with a really small team. Um, so this evolved kind of design is more robust, it's more streamlined, and it has that point in time accuracy of all the features in the system that you really need uh, when you're trying to do machine learning for real. Um, and again, on top of the simplicity, our ML engineers can just iterate. They can make changes to this system and backfill it within just like three or four hours, train a new model and deploy it and then see uh, kind of what's, what's, what's going on. Um, so this is uh, an image of our Flink UI just to show you that these jobs really do uh, allow you to get quite complex. It integrates all of the things that I talked about, multiple data sources, multiple aggregations, joins. We switch into process time to do very low latency joins because again, speed is really, really important to us in certain cases. We can do all sorts of custom logic uh, in these process functions, it's great. And the ML model, it's just like one little square on there. The whole, you know, part of this talk is building the data for these ML models. Well, deploying it for inference is just one little square on this graph. It's so much simpler than having to spin up a whole separate service. You can't do everything with this, but you can do uh, quite a lot. And so many of our models we can run in this style of, of system. And then we have syncs to both out, uh, output stuff to Iceberg, Pulsar, anything that we want um, at the end. Flink really does give you this uh, kind of amazing uh, capability. Um, and now I think the other great thing to report here is like we don't have to think about deployment as much. We built these custom Bazel rules that abstract away all of the authentication, the you know, persistent volumes, all these details that our ML engineers don't want to care about. They can just um, put in any of the kind of regular Flink configs, point it to their job application, and we take care of all the details of containerization, pushing, uh, and even deployment. And again, in that theme of like the power of open source, the deployment is also kind of managed to us. The Flink Kubernetes operator uh, deserves a call out here because this is a custom resource definition. We prepare it and we launch uh, this resource into our cluster. And this operator uh, takes care of the whole life cycle of Flink jobs. So this is you know, deploying it for the first time, taking save points. Uh, it includes high availability and a number of other features that are really, really great. So since we've deployed this system, we've had multiple like double digit metric improvements on internal safety metrics for both uh, the spam area and the account security area. So we really are making Discord a safer platform and protecting our users. Uh, and, and we're just really, really thrilled about that uh, and trying to think about like, oh, what else can we use this, this awesome system for? Uh, so I'll get to the conclusion now. Uh, we've, what we've built is a mature production ready ecosystem for doing ML uh, in real time, end to end, uh, and it really is enhanced by the maturity and the connections between Flink, Iceberg, and Pulsar um, all together in this kind of trifecta. I talked about why ML has the certain requirements around backfill and trade-offs around time, um, and we've kind of solved that real-time state problem and backfill limitations uh, in, this, in this system that we've built. Um, I mentioned that we achieved this kind of critical metric impact and uh, that we were really excited about this technology. So this is kind of like a journey of a thing that we built and now it's prototyped, it's in production and we're like migrating more and more stuff to it. You can use this for other things other than ML. We have uh, ideas to do like faster A-B testing, better experimentation. Um, I mentioned moving into our personalization domain. That's a whole nother area of ML that this uh, thing can possibly improve like certain problems that they're working on when time and speed and this kind of point in time accuracy really matter. Um, and uh, like I said, the, the message here is this whole system was built at Discord with a very tiny number of engineers. And we basically rely on the you know, amazing open source community that has tried to solve similar problems and donated this stuff. And I think that's something that you should really think about if you're trying to build um, something like this uh, at your own company. The kind of technology has kind of hit the critical mass uh, where you can build really, really powerful stuff. Um, and I think that is uh, just really, really cool. So think about that if you are uh, starting your journey into streaming. Um, and so with that, uh, yeah, I'll take questions. Thank you.